It's a great joy to be with you again this evening as we continue our series through 1 John. We're going to get about halfway through chapter 2 tonight. As we talk about life in the new age. Life in the new age. But let's pray together uh, one more time. Father, now we ask for grace and help to hear, believe, trust, obey your word. Pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to live as those who are not in darkness, but who are in the light. And indeed, Lord, the darkness is passing away. So, Lord, I pray that we would Fulfill that divine command, the command of love, Lord. To walk in the light as he is in the light. And to have that hope, Lord, that can only be gained from knowing that we are in Jesus Christ. So bless us this evening, God. Teach us to love. Thank you for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 7. So, we actually talked about it a little bit this morning, but the Bible teaches what, uh, and, and this is pretty widely understood and accepted, what the theologians call inaugurated eschatology. Inaugurated eschatology. So eschatology refers to things of the end or the end times. Inaugurated simply means um, the beginning. And so it seems pretty clear that when you read the Bible in the New Testament, especially the apostles understood that Jesus inaugurated or began the end, the end times. That's why in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews could say, um, uh, God has spoken to us in many times in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Well, he wrote that 2,000 years ago, that they were in the last days. And so it seems quite clear that Jesus has begun a new age, and that's what John, that's what we're going to talk about, and that's what John understands that is happening. He says, the light is already here, and the darkness, he says, is passing away. That is, the new age has already come in Christ. Christ is bringing in a newness to this world through the power of his spirit. Everywhere where he has believed on and trusted, people are being brought to new life in Jesus Christ. They're being made new by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're being prepared for an eternal age that will one day come fully when Christ returns. There, Christ brought in a new covenant a new way to live and relate to God that was not, no longer based on the law, but on the law of love, Paul would describe it, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so something new is happening in Christ, and, and the old is passing away, and the new has come. And so how do we live that? What's that supposed to look like in our lives? What, what privileges do we have as those who are living in the new age. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, from 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. And so if you have a Bible and you're able and willing, I invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. From 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. He says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. 
I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The word of God. You may be seated. Well, let's see three things from our passage this evening. Number one is the presence of the new age. Number two is the practice of of the new age, and number three are the privileges of the new age. So the presence of the new age, the practice of the new age, and the privileges of the new age. First, the presence of the new age. John says there in verse seven, he says, I'm not, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. So he's talking about this commandment, and we're gonna talk about what that is in a second. But he says that it's not new. It says that um, it's, it's that they've had it when from the very beginning. I take that to mean when they first put their trust in Jesus Christ, when they first heard the gospel. And he says that, uh, that this uh, commandment, this old commandment is the word that you have heard. And so he's, he's, he's not writing, he says to them, anything new. Um, I think we could just take a principle from that, and that is that if he's not writing to them anything new, then you know, why is he writing to them? But reality is, is that because of fallen human nature, we just have to be told over and over again before we get it. And that's what he's doing, is he's encouraging them and reminding them of what they already know. And beyond this, um, sometimes we can know something, but not have all the implications of that knowledge worked out. And so, in other words... Uh, sometimes we can know the gospel, but at times still live inconsistently because for whatever reasons, we have not connected the dots about how this truth over here applies to this uh, part of our life over here. And, and it takes time for all the dots to connect and for the gospel to thoroughly saturate and, um, and change areas of, lives that it, of our lives that it has uh, yet to change. And that's true in the life of this, this, this Christian community that John is writing to because uh, these, they, these false teachers have deceived a certain a group among them and this group has actually left and departed from the church and they were, they were denying certain things that we'll talk about later, uh, including the bodily coming of, of Christ. We're not exactly sure what they were teaching, but they were denying, uh, it seems, the, the physical nature of Christ. And, and there was lots of confusion and lots of, and it, and it raised a lot of questions for the true believers because uh, apparently uh, they were challenging them saying, well, you know, if you don't believe this or if you, if you don't know this over here, then you, you don't, you're not truly saved. And John is saying to him, look, you already know everything you need to know. There's no extra things now that these people are telling you that you need to know. You already know. You've had it from the beginning. And I'm just going to remind you of that. And... He says there that the old commandment is the word that you have heard. Well, in chapter 1, he refers to the word as the word of life, which refers to Christ in that, in that passage. And also, we, I think we can say to, uh, to the gospel message in general. And yet here he says that the commandment is the word that you have heard. So in other words, it seems to me that the... he. Uh, John understands that the command, which, which we learn as we read, is the command to love, because he goes on to talk about loving your brother. The commandment, the command to love, is inextricably tied, John, in John's mind, to the gospel message. He says the old commandment is the word that you have heard. So in other words, for John, implicit in the gospel message itself, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is implicit in that is the command that we have to love one another. Remember, as we talked about in the first couple sermons there, for John, he equates all these ideas together. And that is that um, to, uh, uh, to know God is to abide in God, is to keep his commands. Uh, all, all those things are, are tied together. They're, they're one and the same. And so in John's mind, to know God, that is to understand and believe and trust the gospel, is at the same time to be changed by that gospel. It, it, it has the, command, the love command explicitly tied in 
into it. And it's pretty obvious if you think about it. The gospel is what? That Jesus Christ loved us in spite of our sin. To the point that he gave himself. He sacrificed himself for sinners like you and me. He gave his life to deliver his people from their sin in order to bring them into the family of God. Well, that, the message itself, that, that news carries with it an ethical command. And that is this. How can you believe that news and at the same time not love other people as Christ has loved you? How can you, as we've said before, how can you say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me, but I'm not going to love this person over here? That's impossible. How can you do that? The word contains the ethical command. Christ's love for us bears with it the ethical command. Uh, uh, wait for those who believe in him that we are to love as he loved. Jesus said, no greater love has a man than this, that he laid down his life for the brothers. And, 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 and John says, and we also ought to lay down our lives for one another. That's what love is. Jesus said, whoever would follow me must take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And so love is self-giving at personal cost for the good of others. And that's what he's calling us to do. And so they've had this commandment from the beginning because it's tied into the gospel message. And at the same time, John says that it's a new command that he gives. And I think he takes that from John chapter 13, verse 34, where uh, John writes, uh, G- Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And so Jesus calls this a new commandment. I take that to mean this, that this commandment that Jesus is giving to them, if what it is, is it's the, it's the quintessential command of the new covenant, of the new age. In other words, it's the new, it's the new way, in essence, that we are now to love, that we are now to live uh, life as the new covenant people of God, as the new age people of God, right? Because Jesus said things like, Uh, The whole law and the prophets is summed up in this word. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those things, you are, in Jesus, Jesus said, you are keeping the law and the prophets. That is the heart. That is the essence of the law and the prophets. To to be a Christian then, to live as a, uh, a, a new covenant, new age follower of Jesus Christ, means that we are now living a life that is marked by love. Is marked by love. And we know that he's talking about this new age because he goes on to say, the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That is, John understands that something, uh, something, what's the word? Uh, Something epic changing happened in the coming of Jesus Christ. The world, in a sense, up until that time, was covered in darkness. But now that Christ has come, a light is now shining in the world that's doing what? That's causing the darkness to pass away. That is, what we're no longer bound by our sin. We no longer have to live self-centered lives focused on me and my own. We no longer have to try to relate to God through, through works or trying to reach up to God through our works. Rather, God has come down to us in Jesus Christ... And he says that God, Paul says that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So that now from the heart we can love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can love our neighbor as ourselves, And it's the law of love that is bonding on us as Christians. So that the Christian life then is not just a bunch of rules. A lot of people, they, just, they think Christian life is just a bunch of rules. You just check all the boxes and that's what makes you a good Christian. But the Christian life is so much more than that. It's a life of love. It's a, life of, it's a life of self-giving for the good of others because that's how Christ has loved us. And we live that way, John says, because the darkness has passed, is passing away and the true light is already shining. The, the old age is passing away and new life is already here. And if you believe in Christ and are filled with the Spirit, that's already at work in you. It's already living in you. And of course, love here must be biblically defined. And that's, that's very important, too, in our day. Because, you know, you'll, you see bumper stickers that say, oh, just love everybody. But see, love cares for the... Love must also be in accord with reality. 
And, be, and the nature of reality is that there is a God and he rules and reigns over all things and he's ordered things in a certain way and he has created a moral framework in this world and, to, and sin by definition destroys and it hurts and it ruins things. And so by definition then love in a biblical sense doesn't just mean love without care about how a person is living because that's not love. If someone you love is making decisions that's destroying their life, it's not loving to just affirm them. In fact, it's the opposite. So biblical love calls us to love both the, the temporal, physical, and also the eternal, spiritual needs of others. And we must, we must have both. But we can live this way now because the darkness is passing away and the new age is already at work in us. If the Spirit of God is in us, we are already being made new into who God has destined us to be. And so number one here, John talks about the presence of the new age is already here. It's already working. And number two here is the practice of the new age. The practice of the new age. He says in verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. As we said before in this letter, John gives lots of tests, and this test here is the test of love. If we say we're in the light, but we hate our brother, then he says we're still in darkness. And uh, just to be clear here, what, what does John mean by love? We talked about it a little bit, but it seems to me that John, for John, love is not merely one's attitude towards someone, but genuine affection that's coupled with tangible acts of kindness. And, and we see that from 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 17, just the next chapter over. He says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So you see that? What, that, what John is saying there is that he, he sees love as much more than just a feeling, but it's a, feel, it's, it's a, it's a genuine affection that creates action. In other words... If I say I love someone, but if they have a legitimate need that I can meet that I don't meet, then it doesn't matter what I say. I don't love them. And so in other words, love for John is not merely just some kind of feeling. It is coupled, it is something that moves us to tangible acts of kindness. And at the same time, in view of that, I think when he says hates his brother, I think he has more in mind than just a fierce feeling of animosity. So sometimes when we think of hate, we just think of, you know, just rage against someone that you just can't stand. But I think clearly that John means more than that. He's clearly directing this at those who have embraced this false teaching and who have left this community. But clearly, but surely all the individuals who left the, this Christian community didn't necessarily feel this emotional revulsion for their former friends. Surely not all of them felt that way. Maybe some of them did. But I think what John would include here, uh, since the definition of love is something that actually moves us to tangible acts of kindness, I think hate, he would also include the idea of indifference. In other words, in John's view, to hate someone is the, is, is that would be uh, included in that idea of hate would be just to not care, right? It's not that you have a fierce animosity towards someone, but it's just you just don't care, Right? And see, that's important, I think, because sometimes we let ourselves off the hook when we read this passage. We let ourselves off the hook and say, well, that, I don't have to worry about this passage because I don't hate anybody. I don't have an emotional revulsion towards anybody. Well, is there someone you just don't care about? Is, I mean, do you, are there things out there you just say, well, I just don't care? I think John would include that in his idea of hate. So that's the test. Are we moved to genuine affection that moves us to action, acts of love and kindness and compassion to others? That's what love is. That's the test. The new age is invading the old and it's reorienting our lives as Christ, as Christ modeled for us, is reorienting our lives so that our lives are no longer about us, but about God and about others. And that's what it means to live in the light. That's why Jesus said, uh, let, your light, let your light shine before men. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
since we are those who live in the light of Christ and in the light of the new age, our good works will be the light that pushes back the darkness in this world. And the people will see that and say, hey, something's different about you. And that light will shine into their darkness. And so that's the test. Has the light shown into our lives, the light of Christ, has that shown into our lives? Has Christ's love for us so changed our hearts that now we are, that, so now we love others? Is the darkness passing away in our lives and is the light growing brighter or is darkness still in us? And, that, and, that, uh, and then John continues here and what he introduces with a negative, he follows with a positive. He says, so first he says, if we say we're in the light but don't love our brother, we're in darkness. But then he goes on to say, but if we do love our brother, we abide in the light. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. I think what John means by that is that he's, he's, he's using this imagery of light and darkness. I think the stumbling that he's referring to there is talking about the stumbling of the believer. If you walk in the light, see, when you walk in the light, <laughs> you, can, you can see where you're going. I mean, it sounds obvious, but I mean, it's true. If you walk in the light, you can see where you're going. You ever been, you ever been walk, walking in the darkness and then you stub your toe and feel like your whole, you're about to die because <laughs> it hurts so bad? I mean, I think the closest, the closest I might come to losing my salvation is when I stub my toe. <laughs> I mean, it's just terrible, okay? And when you're walking in the darkness, you can't see where you're going, right? He says, that's, but that's the point. That's the difference, he says. If we're walking in the light, we see where we're going. And if we see where we're going, then there's no cause for stumbling. You're not going to stumble if you see where you're going. But if you walk in the darkness, if you don't walk in the light of Christ, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You know, uh, Jesus himself and the apostles, they talked about, they referred to Jesus as a, a, a Old Testament prophecy where Jesus says that he was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That is, they could, that he, he wasn't who they expected him to be and they stumbled over him. If we walk in the darkness, we're going to stumble over things. We're going to get into sin and that sin is going to destroy our lives. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to be broken if we're walking in the darkness. But that's the glory of it is that if you walk in the light, John says, however, there in you, there is no cause for stumbling. If you walk in the light of Christ and you see things in view of Christ, then you actually see the world clearly. You see the world as it truly is. By the power of the Spirit illuminating the truth of God's Word in your life, you have the power, God says, to discern good from evil, from right and wrong. You have the power living in you to know the right decisions to make in all the messiness of life that's going to please God and honor Him. And bring him the greatest glory. You see, you see the decisions in life before you with clarity as either eternally wise or unwise. You have the capacity to see and live in view of reality as things are truly are because you believe the truth. That there is a God who rules over all things before whom we are accountable. And who will one day descend from heaven to gather his people to himself. You can see things clearly because you see the light. You are walking in the light, and if you, if you understand all those things and believe all those things, that's going to bear fruit in our lives, fruits of love, fruits of faithfulness, fruits of self-giving and sacrifice for the good of others because we're walking in the light, and if we walk in that light, we won't stumble. But then John continues and says this, but whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so, all the benefits of walking in the light are negated if you walk in the darkness. And John, of course, I mean, of course he's using spiritual language here. And what that means, of course, then, is that he's not talking about people literally walking in the dark. He's talking about spiritual darkness. But what that means, of course, is it means a very dangerous reality. It means there are those who are walking in darkness and they don't know it. You see, that's the scary part. That's the danger of it, is that you could be walking in darkness and you don't know that you're walking in darkness. That's what being blind means. That's what he says. The darkness has blinded his eyes. You can't see the realities that are before you. You can't see them. But just because we can't see them, just because I can't see that dresser in the dark, doesn't mean it's not there. And if I'm going full force and... and 
and kick it real hard in the night, it doesn't matter whether I didn't believe it was there or not. When I kick it, I know it's there. And the cold, hard reality of Jesus Christ is one day going to confront people and they're going to see that he's there even though they refuse to believe it. And it will be very painful on that day. But that's why John urges us, and it just ties in what we talked about this morning. John urges us to walk in the light, to not walk in darkness. But if we walk in darkness, we're blinded. We're blinded and we can't see where we're going. And that's why at the same time we should... We should stand firm for Christian conviction, but we should also have compassion as well. We have to, we have to remember that if people are walking in darkness, <laughs> I mean, the, you know, all the crazy things that are happening in the news and politics today and things that we, you know, we would disagree with very strongly, but you got to, you, you know, we, we should, but we should see things in light of reality. They, they think those, they think that what they're doing is right and they really believe it. They really believe it's the right thing to do. The question is, what is reality, right? The question is, what is reality? But what we can do is, we, it allows us to kind of understand that, and, and to, that means we really need to approach the question from different issues. I, I feel like we might even obscure, we obscure the, the real problem sometimes when we get focused on the issues and not get down to the real dividing issue is what is reality. What is the nature of reality? What are the fundamental truths? Because those will, are, are what guide us in the more practical questions of life. We need to get down and expose the light, shine the light of Christ. And only when the light of Christ is shining will people be able to see that they are in darkness. And so this is a very real danger of walking in darkness. And the danger here is very great. And here's why. Because it's very possible to spend our whole lives chasing good things that aren't inherently bad. But you've chased the good things, the quote-unquote good things, but, you have igno- but at the same time ignored and neglecting the greatest realities of the world. And I'm afraid that that will be the case for many people. And we as Christians, we just can't, we can't allow that to happen. Right? We can't, there are things that aren't inherently bad, career, family, success, wealth, ease, comfort, security. But at the same time, if we pursue those things as ends of themselves, then what we've done is we've loved the gift over above the giver. And we have neglected the most eternal realities, sin, righteousness, judgment, heaven, hell, the resurrection of the dead, and life everlasting. You, can, you see, you can be in darkness and you can be perfectly content and not even know it. But we as Christians, we can't do that. We, can't, we, have to, we have to walk into the light. We have to see things as they truly are. We have, to live, uh, we have to live in view of reality. And so there's the presence of the new age. Number two, there's the practice of the new age. And finally, number three, the privileges of the new age. The privileges of the new age. In those remaining verses there in 12 through 14... Um, it's a little confusing about how it fits in with the rest of the passage. Maybe you've wondered that as well. It's almost poetic. And he writes to three different groups in, in, in two triads, so two groups of three. He addresses children, fathers, and young men in that order, and he does it twice. Okay, And uh, he almost says the same thing in each one. And so some, some commentators, you know, they were all over the you know, the page on this. Is he talking to three different groups? Is he talking to levels of spiritual maturity? As in, you know, children in Christ and fathers in Christ? Or is he talking in terms of literal age? You know, like babies or, or fathers or young men? Um, some commentators argue that when he talks about children, he's actually referring to all believers because in other parts of the letter, John refers to all Christians as his children, right? Because he's an old man. And then... And then if that's the case, then fathers and young men are just, he's really addressing just two groups specifically, and then the the group about the children just refers to all believers in general. But regardless of where you land, I think there's some clear principles that we can can draw, draw, and we'll look at each one uh, in turn. First, first in each triad, John addresses the children first, the children first, and he, he says, He says two things to the children. He says, I'm writing to you, he says, in the first case, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And then in the second case, because you know the Father. 
And so we can really view that as that these things are the starting point and the core and fundamental gift um, that are indeed granted to all believers, even those who are young in Christ. And that is that the basic starting point and the fundamental gift and blessing of God is to be forgiven of our sins. And through the forgiveness of our sins, we come to know God Almighty. That's the, that is the, the great privilege of the new age. That the God of heaven, who is all-powerful and almighty, who, who owes nothing to us and before whom we are nothing, has come down to us in Jesus Christ so that, he could, so that our sins might be forgiven so that we could know him. That's the heart of Christianity. That we can have personal relationship with the God of the universe. That is that he's not far off, he's not far away. You can get in your closet and get on your knees and talk to God through Jesus Christ because of what he has done for you on the cross. And the Father in heaven guarantees that he will hear you because you are in his beloved Son. That is the blessing, that is the privilege of being a new age in the new age, a new age follower of Jesus Christ, of being in the light that is already at work in us for all who belong to Christ, old or young. And then the next group John addresses is this. He addresses the fathers. And he says the same thing to the fathers in both, ca- both cases. He says, I write to you because you know him who is from the beginning. He addresses them and he really highlights the... Um, the duration of their faith because he says, because he references, you know him whom, who is from the beginning. And so by saying it that way, he's highlighting the duration of their faith, that from the beginning of their belief in him, they've known him this entire time. And so whether he means mature in terms of spirituality or just in terms of age, um, you know, it, it, we don't have to draw a sharp distinction there because oftentimes one goes with the other. Um, the longer that you have lived life with someone, <laughs> the more you know them. <laughs> Sounds obvious, but it's true. You see, because when you live life with someone, what do you do? Well, you, you see them, you, you see how they speak, you see how they act, but the real test of knowing someone is see how they respond in various situations, right? You know, it's, people are like a sponge. You know, a sponge can look nice on the outside until you squeeze it and see what comes out. You, what you, the way you really get to know people really is you spend time with someone and you see them, you see how they respond when they're squeezed. And you see how they handle various situations in life. And you see how they treat other people and you see how they they do this and that and the longer time you see the longer time you walk with someone the more you know them the more you've seen their character the more you see their consistency their convictions their love and and their fears there are some things that can only be learned about someone through time and what john is highlighting here is that these fathers are blessed those who have known christ for a long time they're blessed because they have known him who is from the beginning. They have seen God bear with them and bear them up through difficult seasons of life. They have seen him carry them through things that humanly possible, <laughs> that, that were not humanly possible to be carried through. They, they've seen God help them to the other side of things that they didn't think they'd ever see the other side of. And they have, they have seen God and walked with God through those seasons of life, and so they know Him. The longer we walk with God, the more we really know Him and who He is in every season of life. I mean, you have to think about Abraham, 99 years old, when God told him that he would have a son. But guess what? Abraham had walked with God for a long time. And so when God heard... When Abraham heard the promise, the Bible says, even though he was 99 years old and Sarah was 90 years old, when God told Abraham he would have a son, the Bible says Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. 
How could Abraham believe that God would do something like that? Because he has walked with God for a long time. That's how. And he has seen God been faithful over and over and over again. And so he believed God. That's the privilege of the new age, to know him and know him well. And the final group John addresses is this. He addresses the young men. He addresses the young men. And to the young men, he says, I write to you because you have overcome the evil one. And then in verse 14, he says, I write to you because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. These these younger people and, and, you know, in in their day, a young person would really be, you know, even in their 30s and things like that. But he's writing to these young people because they're in the thick of the battle with Satan. You know, um, some of you may have figured out that your body kind of wears out. And um, you just can't do the things you used to do anymore. And, uh, and sometimes the Lord can use that to help free you from sin because you just can't do it. <laughs> and uh, you just can't get around. You just can't put yourself in locations to get yourself into trouble. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. But see, the young people... The young men, they're in the thick of the battle with Satan because there are attendant temptations that come with the energy, mobility, and vitality, and also inexperience of youth. That's, there's a reason why, therefore, Paul told Timothy to flee youthful lusts. Right? There are certain types of temptations that are associated with youth that we should flee and, and battle and fight. But the point here for John, however, is not a warning but it's actually rather an encouragement. He's not telling them these things. He is already telling them that they, he says, you have overcome the evil one. You are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So, he's a, so in this Christian community that he's writing to, there are already, there are a number of young uh, believers in this group who, who are still growing in their faith who are being successful in their walk with the Lord who are overcoming the temptations of the the devil, who are are resisting the devil and he is fleeing from them, as the Apostle Peter said. And I think it's no accident that he puts it this way. He, He kind of answers this question. How are these young people overcoming the evil one? He says, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Right? I think that's the key. That's the key to overcoming the evil one, is having the word of God abide in you. When your mind is being saturated with God's word and God's truth. You see, because who's the devil? It only makes perfect sense that he would say that. Because the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. Why, 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 would, he put, why would he put the two like that? The word of God and then overcoming the evil one. Because who's the evil one? John says that the devil is what? A liar. And the father of lies. So how do you fight a battle against someone who's primarily a liar? You know the truth. That's how you do it. You have to know the truth. And the only way to know the truth is to saturate your mind in the word of God. John puts it this way, to have the word of God abide in you. What what does it mean? Well, it, it must mean this, that God's word, you don't just know it up here, but it lives in you and it lives through you where the Word of God is saturating your heart and your mind so that you have the capacity to see and to hear. You, you can hear the, the, the lisp of the, 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 the forked tongue of the serpent. You can hear it when a lie is being fed to you. And you can sense and say, no, that's not true. You see, a key... A, one of the key things that we learn as Christians as we grow in our faith, we learn that not everything that's on the internet is true. <laughs> and not everything that a movie star tells you is true or that they sing about is true. And not every thought that pops in your head is true. And not every feeling that you feel is true. Because the, not only is the devil a liar and the father of lies, but the Bible says our own heart is deceitful and sick. And so... 
that basic the, the way we do battle in the Christian life is knowing the truth and have and by being so saturated with the truth, we can then test these thoughts that are being fed uh, to us by the devil, by the culture, and by our own sinful hearts. And, and a thought can pop into your head and you can say, no, that's not true. I won't think about that. I won't think that about that person. I won't presume that that's what that person's thinking because I can't read their minds. I won't think these thoughts. I'll take my thoughts captive to the Lordship of Christ and I'll dwell on what's true. That's, that's, part, that's the, the major part of the battle when we do the evil one and John's encouraging them that they indeed have overcome the evil one because the word of God abides in you. So what have we seen this evening? The presence of the new age, the practice of the new age, and the privileges of the new age. You see, we can take hope and we can take heart as followers of Christ because the new age is already breaking through. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are already living in the end times, the new age, as we await the fullness of it to come when Christ returns. But see, we have spiritual power. We have spiritual privileges of those who have lived in the new age. So let us exercise them for the glory of God and for Christ. And if you don't know Christ, maybe the Lord has shown you this evening that you thought you were walking in the light while really you're walking in the darkness. You can come. You can come to the light. You can know him who has lived and died and has risen from the dead. And you can find eternal life and you can walk in the light. And when you walk in the light, you won't stumble. But you'll have the light of life. Let's pray. Thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that new life is already at work in us who call on your name. That we don't have to live like we used to live, but that we can shine like